Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this first talk of the second track of the GNU Tools Cauldron 2024. Uh, so we are going to discuss uh, memory allocation this morning, especially for per-CPU data. So uh, I'm going, my name is Mathieu Desnoyers. I am a CEO at Efficius and uh, also a Linux kernel uh, maintainer. So the goals of this presentation today, I want to discuss scaling of data structures by partitioning, uh, of course, for user space. I want to discuss challenges that are associated with the use of per-CPU data in user space, uh, memory use, false sharing, cache line waste. Uh, I want to present the LibRSec mempool per-CPU allocator I've uh, created uh, in the past year. Uh, and I want to discuss <clears throat> which GNUC library data structures can benefit from this kind of allocator. So my own ex expected takeaways, they are to gather feedback <clears throat> on the LibRSec mempool design uh, from memory allocator experts, if there are in some in the room. Uh, I want to get feedback on my planned future work, and I want to probe for community interest to integrate the LibRSec mempool allocator into the GNUC library. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so let's start uh, starting slowly. It's uh, the first talk in the morning. So scaling data structures. Uh, I, will, I, I will first quickly discuss scope of data structures, partitioning data structure. So scope of data structures. We have local variables. They are on the stack. We don't care that much about it because they are already thread local. We have static definitions. So they end up in the data, program data. So that can cause some issue in terms of concurrency. We'll come back to that later. Then we have dynamic allocation on the heap. So it's either used locally by a thread, or it can be also shared data structures. So now, when it comes to partitioning, so we have global variables, we have single instance that's used across all threads and CPUs, typically with locking or some synchronization strategy. We have thread local storage, where each thread accesses its own data, and this is typically uh, statically defined. Uh, we have per CPU data, where each CPU access its own data. So that's, there are, those are ways to partition a problem. So coming back to thread local storage. So that's, this is one common strategy that is used in user space when you want to have something that is really local to your own thread. So it does have its downsides, however. So it, it does an inefficient use of the CPU cache when the workload has much more threads than the system has CPUs, when the data structure would be better suited for other uh, strategies. We'll see that later. Uh, it's only static definition, so we could argue that the static definition in a dynamically loaded shared object is actually dynamically allocated memory, but let's not go into those details. In terms of program semantic, that's static allocation, a static definition. Uh, initialization of large TLS areas at, uh, will likely slow down thread creation, so if you have short-lived threads, that can become uh, a significant uh, overhead. And uh, so we have different TLS model, global dynamic, initial exec. So if you want to be certain that there will be no failure in terms of allocation with the, as far as I know, with the current new lips in, uh, implementation, if you have TLS variables in shared objects, they need to be global dynamic to make sure that, yes, Florian, uh, microphone. Um, yeah, so global dynamic TLS is allocated lazily and uh, the allocation can fail, so that's not really great. Um, the other issue with uh, the initial exec model is that um, with that model it can happen that you can't deal open a shared object that uses uh, initial exec TLS because we have to reserve a certain amount up front at process start and if you use that up, then exactly. it's over. So there's basically two ways that this can fail and we don't have a fail safe. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's not that great. And it does have side effect. If you use global dynamic, it can do memory allocation lazily and call into the memory allocator yeah. uh, and with locks. The other issue I'd like to raise is that uh, uh, you say that it's in inefficient because it scales with the number, per thread data scales with the number of threads. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that on certain types of systems, the number of CPUs is way la larger than typical thread users within a single 
processes. So true, but it, it does not imply. So it's not because you run on a very large system that you're not running in a container with CPUs that constraints applied. Yes, exactly, and we don't see that in our technology with the technology we use today in DLC. So it is a bit. Yeah, but for us, Looks it becomes like more and more fre frequent, this use case where uh, our customers have very large machines, and then they run tons of containers on those machines, each of the container being, well, as its own machine, but then, I mean, yeah. So we, we have to take that into account. It's uh, more and more common. Uh, okay, so an alternative to thread local storage, per CPU data. So it's a partitioning strategy uh, which is widely used in the Linux kernel, but not so much in user space as far as I know. Uh, and basically, I mean, the intuitive way to do per CPU data allocation is really an anti-pattern, and I will show why. So <clears throat> the typical way is to allocate an array of per CPU items. Let's say you have a structure, and you want to have per CPU instances of that structure. So let's just create an array with number of possible CPU times that structure. So and then you can index using get get CPU or the CPU ID fields from RSEC or even the concurrency ID field from RSEC, which, which is now available since Linux 6.3. But uh, yeah, so, but this is not, so how to index that is not the topic of this talk. The topic of this talk is really about layout of the memory allocation to enhance per CPU data structures. So, Here's the anti-pattern when you have uh, those arrays. So the first case on the left, it's basically you allocate an array of structures. Those structures might be smaller than the size of your cache line. Then you have false sharing. As the uh, different CPUs are uh, working on different data within that same cache line, they actually need to exchange that cache line back and forth, which we call false sharing. So OK, let's do the easy solution. Let's cache line align with uh, 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 type attributes uh, align on the size of the cache line, each of those structure. So now it's good. You have no more false sharing, but you are wasting tons of cache line, hot cache line on your system with padding. So it's also inefficient. So, and it might not show up if you do micro benchmark, but as you start to scale up and have a larger benchmark where you have, you are pushing the limits of your L1 or L2 cache, then you will start to see degradations. Uh, so, the downside of these anti patterns. If the elements are not cache line aligned, false sharing hurts performance. If they are cache line aligned, you waste precious cache line bytes and you reduce your functional density of the CPU cache. So let's bring in as a topic the Linux kernel per CPU allocator. So it basically, uh, so it is a memory allocator for per CPU data in the Linux kernel. It maps memory ranges on each CPU. And basically, when it allocates data, it's allocating at the same relative offset for each of those CPU. So you allocate once, and you actually semantically allocate data on each of the CPUs at the same offset from the base of each CPU. So what I did is I ported that concept to user space. Uh, I call it the LibRSec mempool per CPU allocator. And it really, so it's part of LibRSec because it was kind of convenient to place it there, but it does not use the RSec syscall at all. So it is a memory allocator for per CPU data. Um, so you basically create memory pools. Each memory pool maps a memory range, which is an array of per CPU areas. So I will uh, show graphically a nice uh, graphic from uh, Simon Marquis. He did that uh, uh, yesterday. Thank you, Simon. Uh, so, uh, and basically the allocation uh, against the pool reserve memory at the same offset for each CPU. And it will all become clearer with di this diagram. So as you see, we have the per CPU areas. And then as we allocate struct A, uh, so we reserve at the same offset within each CPU areas for struct A. Then struct B comes after. So the rest would be unallocated. So the access pattern, so we basically replace accessing per CPU variable, the anti pattern where we have an array of those variables where we have the base pointer plus CPU number 
multiply by the size of item. So we, so we basically swap the order around. So we have a pointer to the item in, let's say, in its uh, CPU zero range. Then we add to this the CPU number multiplied by the post write to reach the proper CPU data. So, and I, I provide a def default post write of 64K, but this can be overridden by the, the user. So, allocating from a pool. So, the allocation returns a pointer in the area of CPU zero. And we combine this information about the base of the, well, in that pointer, it combines information about the base of the pool and the offset of the item. So, with the metadata, how it looks like, so we have those per CPU values, we have a header page, I will come back to how we get, when we want to free a pointer, there's actually a way, uh, things are aligned in such a way that we can mask the pointer to get the header page. There's a canary page to handle fork, I will talk about that later. There's init values to uh, make sure we don't reserve memory on CPUs that are not actively used. I will come back to that later as well. Uh, so I will come back to this slide a lot, actually. And then uh, we have a robust mode with validation of double free, of corruption, with uh, poison values and everything. So the free list in robust mode, we place it there. If it's not in robust mode and we have init values, it's placed in the init value uh, area. Okay, freeing items from the pool. So, I decided to do uh, the mempool API as uh, really something that provides multiple pools of memory. So the users could have isolation uh, when, they, when they use a, a pool uh, area. So I, I know malloc, for instance, if you have that different libraries and the program all using malloc, if there's a m misbehavior from one program, it's kind of harder to track. So corruption can be observed as a side effect to another library, for instance. So I did not want that, so multiple pools. But, so when you want to free a pointer, one approach, the easy approach with multiple pools would be to pass an additional pointer to the pool we want to, pr to free from and the pointer. And I did not want that. It's not convenient to have to pass around information about the pool uh, to which the pointer belongs everywhere in the program. So the problem there is reaching the pool free list from a pointer. So I, what I ended up doing is to map each pool range at aligned addresses. Then we can find the base by applying a mask to the pointer to be freed. Uh, and this is actually a trick that is similar to how the Linux kernel finds the task struct from the, uh, uh, the stack pointer in the kernel. Uh, because the, the, those ta task structs are aligned and the stack is aligned along with this. Just masking the pointer gives us the task struct. So I did a similar trick. So the header, header page, page is placed <clears throat> before the base of the range and it contains the header structure that describes the range, the whole pool, and the free list. Uh, yes, Carlos? I was going to uh, comment that it's exactly the same way that glibc finds the arena. Right, so we do 64 meg alignments and then you mask at that, which gives you the arena uh, structure and then you work it out from there, so. Okay, perfect. Um, so there's, however, there's no align and map system call uh, exposed by the Linux kernel. So what we did is we created our own align and map. It basically allocates an area of memory that is large enough to be certain that we contain the align range we need the kernel places it wherever it wants, and then we unmap the pieces we don't need. That's basically how we do it. So, okay, now let's talk about memory initialization. So a common pattern when we allocate memory is to allocate a chunk of memory and then initialize its data. When it's a single memory area, that's relatively easy. When we're talking about per CPU data, where the number of possible CPU can be 512 plus on the new APIC systems, uh, well, this act of poking into each per CPU uh, memory is actually reserving tons of memory. Maybe for nothing. If the system, if the process is constrained uh, with scheduler affinity or CPU sets, there are very large chances that many of those CPUs won't ever be used. But, I mean, it, and this can change dynamically. So you need to be able to react to the fact that it changes under your foot. So, uh, yeah, typical pattern storing to each CPU. Large system, that's a problem. Okay, how I solve this? 
So I'm making the memory allocator aware of what the initialization values need to be. So, and that's optional. I mean, you can allocate without initialization, zero, initialize uh, when you allocate, or there's this malloc in it, where you pass as argument what the initialization value should be. So, and then what I did, so this init range, so let's back a couple of slides, let's uh, back up, yeah, init values. So there's an additional range there that's used to store the initial values for the allocated memory. It's not used by any of the CPUs per se, so what I do, so this init range is a shared mapping. So I create a memfd, you can see it as a file in slash tmp, semantically. Uh, and the init range is, is a shared mapping. Then each of the CPU, uh, initially when the mempool is created, it's a private copy on write mapping of that same init range. So it's a second window on the same data. So, and those copy on write mappings are only going to populate actual reserved pages when the CPUs are storing to those uh, ranges because of the kernel copy on write. And at that point, it takes a copy of the init range page and then it allocates its, its own anonymous page. So, the memory initialization after allocation like this, so we write the initial content of the newly allo allocated area within the init range, uh, that, uh, the, the part we've just allocated. Then we iterate on all possible CPUs, but rather than writing to each of those CPU and reserving memory, we read the content visible from each CPU mapping and compare it with the init range content. If it's the same, we don't need to write because no copy on write has happened before, uh, well, since the beginning of the lifetime. So the data is correct, no store needed. We don't need to reserve additional pages. Uh, if on mismatch, that means a copy on write has happened. So that page has already been reserved. So we then need to store to the memory area for that CPU on that page. So we basically end up making sure we only reserve memory when they are actually being stored to by active CPUs. We don't have to reserve anything just for the initialization of the newly allocated memory. So that's actually one of the, I would say, most important tricks in this memory allocator. Now, that can be problematic with fork and clone. So because the init range is a shared mapping, it is also shared across parent and children processes across fork and clone. So ideally, I would really like to have a new type of mapping which would be shared within a process, not across the whole system. But that's a semantic we do not have today. So, and that would be a question, I uh, that's a question I'm keeping for Linux Plumbers Conference and I want to discuss that with the uh, memory management uh, uh, people. Maybe they have some good ideas for, for us. So my current workaround, so I use them advice, don't fork and wipe on fork. So let's go back to this, yeah, okay. So all the per CPU mappings and the init values, so that's all uh, don't fork. So what happens is on fork, the kernel will um, basically not map those pages in the child process. So, it, so and I, I document that people should not be using those mappings across a fork. However, what it does not give us is a clean way to know that in the child we can basically unallocate some of the header page, canary page, the other resources. So in order to make sure, oh yeah. Um, one, two, yeah. Uh, so what's so special about that memory, unlike all the other memory that is shared over fork borders and clone borders, that your type of memory must not be shared. Why not just accept the fact that it is you know, still existing? Because I want to share it between the init values and the per CPU ranges. Yeah, but why do you want to do, don't want that? Why I want to share it? No, well, no, yep, over fork borders, I mean. Why I don't want to share it? Yeah. Yes, uh, because the init values 
if, and, and even the per CPU data, right? If I share that across fork, uh, then the child can corrupt the memory content of the parent because they are shared, yeah, yeah. but I of don't course, want. Of course, but which is exactly the same problem with all the other memory that is shared over fork borders. Yeah, but I don't, so the semantic is process local memory there. I mean, I'm doing a memory allocator for what should be seen as copy on write process local memory, where on fork, the children get a copy on write version of those pages and they cannot modify the content of the parent. That's the semantic I want. But here, I'm doing a trick with the init value so, so, so that so they just, can... Just yeah. to be sure, we are only talking about the init values. Yes, right. it's only the init values, okay. but I and, need and, to keep the, the problem, relationship. And the, and the problem you have is because you use the MMFD. Yeah. And that is shared over Fox, which you don't want. Yes, so the MMFD is, yes, copied into the, the, the child, uh, the, the same file yeah. descriptor, but the problem is the mapping. The shared mapping of that POSIX MMFD is also mapped on, yes. in the parent and child, so and why, it's the same it, backing. So I don't quite see why, why you map it shared then if it's not supposed to be shared. The alternative is map private, and map private as a semantic where init value cannot be, so whatever you update within init value becomes copy on write, as it's on pages, it's not going to be observable from the CPUs. That's not the semantic I need within the process. Um, so is it the case that you change the init values content after it was yes. created? Yes, I change it so it's observable from the CPUs mm. as long as the CPUs do not issue writes. When they issue stores, then they get their own copy on write mapping and then they are separate from the init values. But until they do that, they observe this, the exact same data as the init values. No. Mm. Yeah, that's... Uh, uh, Florian. I suspect there's a way to get the semantics you want without map shared using user fault FD, but that's probably something for the kernel. Yeah, and Even it's fairly recent as well. No, it, it's a pretty old syscall actually, but uh, it hasn't seen wide usage outside of Android, I believe. And I think it, it might allow you to intercept the page fault for the CPU to CPU, CPU zero to CPN, CPU N pages, and then provide, uh, because you know that it's going to be a private copy, you don't, you can just uh, instruct the kernel to uh, put the exact data there and you can track the effect. We'll have to discuss that more because I remember when I went that route, I looked at user fault FD and there were limitations uh, in user, I don't recall which, but there were some reasons, I don't recall which, why I did not use user fault FD there. We can't, we can't use it in glibc as a general uh, mechanism because of the file descriptor. That's one. That is That's that one, but there were other things where the semantic were not quite what I needed, but I, yeah. I don't have that I, I in my mind. Like it, it, I haven't used it myself, but I know it exists, and I think it might be a fit here. Yeah, but, yeah. Well, but I, I cannot answer you right now, mm -hmm. but I remember there were technical reasons uh, uh, based on the semantic that user fault FD provided that did not map what I needed. But I, yeah, I don't recall them. It's been, uh, it was in my mind six months ago. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, how do we handle uh, uh, spread mig how do handle, uh, spread migration between processes or scheduling some threads when you have more threads um, processes? So from the allocator perspective, uh, uh, it, there's basically a mutual exclusion on allocation. So that's, uh, on allocation, how uh, mutual, mutual exclusion is provided. So there's a single thread that can allocate or free from the pool at any given point. Uh, so mutex per pool. Then in terms of using the memory, I mean the memory has been put in place with locking, then it's handed back to the application, then multiple threads can use that memory. So is your question in the context of how do I handle the fact that multiple CPUs can be using the mappings while the copy on write is happening or things like that? Uh, well, more fundamentally, uh, 
if you have more threads and CPUs, you need some, uh, have some memory. And you wanted to do all this in user space, so how would you know when a thread gets migrated from one CPU to another? Oh, okay, I see. So it doesn't matter. Uh, so a thread at some point will be on a CPU and will issue something like get, get CPU or read the current CPU ID field from RSEC. So statistically, for performance reason, uh, I mean, in terms of performance, it will typically work on its own CPU memory. In the unlikely case where it gets migrated between the moment it read its current CPU number and the moment it writes or reads from uh, per CPU area. So there are two scenarios there. The, common, the typical scenario would be you have no other synchronization in place. So yes, you get migrated and then you use atomic operations or something like that to make sure that even if you touch remote CPU memory, uh, you, um, uh, you, you are consistent, but you can also use restartable sequences. So restartable sequences allow you to create a region of uh, assembler instructions that is guaranteed to either execute uh, completely on your given CPU without preemption, without signal delivery, or abort. So with this, you can do things like, okay, let's implement a compare and exchange. It's a load, a test, branch, store. So you can do those instructions within a RSEC critical section, and the Linux scheduler is actually kind of, well, making sure that it either completes without migration or gets aborted before the store that has the side effect. So you don't actually um, make thread local data op obsolete because you still need it for anything you have permanently for the thread. Uh, yeah, I mean, thread local storage still exists. That's a separate strategy. What I'm uh, uh, doing here is I'm proposing other w strategies for use cases where having per CPU data is a better fit for the problem than per thread. It's not a replacement for TLS. Yeah, but. So you, you need different program design models. You can't just do a thread as many as you want and then expect this to work together. You, you need to, your threading model must be, must take into account that there are a certain number of CPUs. Now, for instance, it's a good fit for things like uh, uh, per CPU arena free lists. It's a good fit for statistics counters. Uh, rather than having tons and tons of counters per thread or having global counters where everyone is going to catch, uh, bounce a cache line, then you can do this per concurrency ID, per CPU, and basically get the best of all worlds. Minimum uh, cache uh, impact, minimum memory uh, consumption, and uh, as fast as if it was DLS. So that's... That's a good combination for many problems, and they, those are problems that the GNU libc happen to have. <laughs> so, yeah. Other questions? Does it answer your question? I get a feeling may, maybe I may not have completely answered your question. How do you deal with uh, waste in the first place? Like, you allocate some stuff, then you free something, then you allocate something bigger? That's, um, they, they are fixed size. Up per CPU and uh, what so, we do. So holes compared to, let's say, uh, the malloc allocator, right? Where it has to uh, pair things together and things like that. So the, I, I made my life easy. So I chose to make each of those pool. They are fixed size power of two. Right? So you create a pool to allocate items for a given size. And if you need to have variable size items, then you create a set of pools, then you instantiate pools with different power of two sizes in there, then it's going to bin and select the right pool size for the memory you want to allocate. So that's what I did there. If there's a need or a wish to have something that uh, it allows uh, variable size data, we could go that direction as well. There's nothing inherently that limits this in the core design, but that would be kind of, well, I mean, people would have to put requirements to do that. Currently, it's not, it's not doing as malloc as a, okay, let's uh, 
pack things together, uh, have different size allocation and everything. But that could evolve in that direction if needed. There's no fundamental limits to that. Except that the problem hasn't been solved for a single CPU allocator. <laughs> yes, it's not solved here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that, that my intent is not to solve this here. Yeah. But yeah, we, well, but we can discuss this, that uh, further uh, later on. Other questions? Or, uh, yeah, okay, let's continue. Initialization has been discussed. Uh, okay, I was on the M advice, don't fork M advice, wipe on fork to handle fork and clone. Let's go back to this. Okay, so M advice, don't fork for pretty much everything except the canary page. And, well, the header page is uh, really uh, as none of those uh, flags. So, uh, canary page, I use mAdvice wipe on fork because how I do is I, I, write, I store a one at the beginning of the canary page to detect if I'm accessing it from the parent or from a child after a fork. If I'm in the parent, the one that I store there is there. Because of the wipe on fork, it's a zero in the child. So that's how I figure out, oh, I'm in a child. So I know that the user should never call any of the APIs on that pool. And the only thing I allow the user to do is to destroy the pool, because that's convenient. If you're using ptred at fork, if you're in the child after fork, the only thing you really want to do is to destroy the pool. So it allows you to at least do that on the pool. And I could, so, and I needed a way to have something that is still present in the child that is not on map in the child, because I cannot assume that there won't be any other call to mmap before my, my code is called that would remap something in those memory areas under my feet, which are un unrelated to my own code. So that's why I needed to have something distinct, this canary, that tells me you are in the child. Okay, for clone. So, additional features that are available, this is kind of a quick list of things we've done in this project. So, the pool can auto-expand. So, when a range is fully allocated, it basically can allocate another range, uh, which allows still allocating uh, stuff. So, so, it expands automatically up to an uh, upper bound that's con configurable by the end user, at which point, uh, if it's reached, the uh, memory allocation will fail. Um, so there's, I won't go into too much details, but this init range trick where we do copy on write from the init values. So that's one of the way a pool can be configured. The other way is to map copy on write, not from the init range, but from the zero page that's provided by the kernel. So the, the trick there, so this, is, this provides more flexibility if you want to do per CPU data in shared memory across processes. So there, there are some benefits there, but it limits you in terms of initialization of your uh, memory. So when you allocate uh, items, if you zero that memory uh, for the initialization, then you're good because we don't have to store into each per CPU memory areas. But if you initialize your memory with other content, then we need to go and poke into each per CPU uh, memory areas, and then we need to reserve tons of memory. So it, it's, uh, it's less flexible. Well, it's more flexible for some use case, but it, uh, re it puts some requirements in terms of uh, initialization values for wh whatever you allocate. So, uh, we have robust free list corruption checks. So, it checks for double freeze, leaks on pool destruction, free list corruption, poison value corruption. That can be enabled when you create the pool. It's a parameter you pass, whether you want to have. So, so those attributes, they work uh, in the same way where uh, how you create threads. You can put, uh, have attribute passed to the threads. Uh, so, when you create a pool, you can optionally pass attributes to your pool creation where you can set those things and decide what you want enabled. So there's a concept of mempool set. It's a collection of power of two allocation size pools, uh, and uh, it allows allocation of variable length data by binning. So it basically looks and finds the first pool that's large enough to perform the requested allocation. So in terms of future work, so one of the things I noticed in some recent benchmarking work I've done uh, in uh, restartable sequence test cases 
is so what I very strong, strongly suspect is caused by the hardware prefetcher. So uh, basically, okay. Let's say you have a streaming pattern where you basically write, uh, read or write sequentially, uh, in my case it was sequential write, a whole bunch of memory, and then you stop. And let's say you're unlucky, and that memory happens to be at the very end of one of the per CPU ranges. The, what I suspect is that the hardware prefetcher is actually going to bleed that into reading into the next memory range, which has impacts on cache locality and is actually causing false sharing from the hardware prefetcher. So what I intend to do is to put some guard page at the end of each of those ranges to make sure that I prevent the hardware prefetcher from bleeding into the next per CPU area. So, yes. Uh, microphone, sorry. Just a note that that may not save you because some hardware prefetchers, uh, presuming that you do this by making the guard page non-readable non by the process or something, some hardware prefetchers don't bother to check privileges like that and will just keep, re keep reading into the, ne into the next region anyway uh, and, ch and do the privilege checks when it tries to read the cache line. So it may not help on some, on some hardware. It may on some. Yeah, but I, I, what I intend to do is not necessarily to stop the prefetcher from trying to poke memory. What I intend to do is make sure that so by guarding a whole page at the end of each per CPU range, I expect the prefetcher won't read more than a page. And then I expect that uh, basically, so the next CPU is not going, so, so what I want to prevent is to have two CPUs working on the same data, right? So if that data is reserved and unused, wasted, nobody's gonna touch, touch it other than the prefetcher from the first CPU, so that should be good. That's my expectation. You're hoping the prefetcher doesn't read too much data. Mm, that seems like something that might be ob uh, obviated by time as they decide let's read 128K at once or something. True. <laughs> so so I, I, I would make that area size uh, configurable uh, and optional. So if someone cares more about using all his memory, uh, that's fine. But, but that's only virtual memory, right? So it should never really be reserved. That's another thing. Okay. need to have something there to prevent it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. For clone, additional features, future work. Okay. Next point, figuring out a way to uh, have shared mappings only shared within the process, not as its children. Uh, that's one of the topics we've discussed. Uh, also, okay, that's another thing. So, so we have larger and larger machines. Uh, in my test setup, I have 384 hardware threads uh, over two sockets. So if you allocate per CPU data for each of the CPUs, that starts to be a lot. So, uh, and our customers are more and more using uh, C groups, uh, which uh, they call containers, uh, to control the amount of uh, the number of CPUs. So there are actually two ways to do it. <clears throat> One is uh, more, well, so it's not really what we would say cloud native. They use CPU sets. So CPU sets re require a very good knowledge of the topology of the machine on which you want to apply the CPU sets. So it's not as easy as saying, oh, this container can be deployed on any machine and requires four cores. No, you need to have more knowledge about the, the topology of your machines. The alternative is the CPU controller, where you can basically express the constraint on your uh, C group as being, okay, I want that much time slice per that period of time. So it's basically constraints you put on the Linux scheduler, but nothing prevents. So if you say, I want 200% of CPU time, so it gives you semantically two CPUs, but nothing prevents the Linux scheduler from giving you 10% of CPU time over 20 CPUs. That's all fair and fine. But in terms of per CPU data allocation, this has a huge impact on the memory footprint. So what I want to enhance or uh, propose in terms of new uh, things in the CPU uh, C group is to add the notion of a CPU max concurrency value. 
So you could say, I want this container to run on at most five CPUs, never more. So without requiring people to have deep knowledge about the topology of the machine on which it's going to run, it, they could express that limit. So that's one of the things I also would like to gather feedback on from you guys if you think that would be useful. Uh, and I plan to discuss that at uh, LPC. I have a session planned uh, in the container uh, microconference uh, that's coming uh, next week. So there's that. Uh, discussion. Uh, so it's basically how can a per CPU allocator be useful within the GNU libc. So some example use, uh, it can be used to implement per CPU arenas, free list for malloc, it could be used to implement statistic counter for per CPU uh, rather than global or per thread. It can be used to implement per CPU caches uh, rather than a global cache with locking or per thread where it's kind of tricky to decide what's the right approach or based on the uh, topology of your process, so how many threads uh, was the level of concurrency, then you could do that per concurrency ID caches and your local. Uh, other ideas that come to mind? So that's really kind of the last, uh, last slide. If you have uh, questions, comments, there are links to the uh, API and C implementation. Uh, the mempool code is MIT, so it's fairly easy to just pull into other projects. Um, uh, and yes, uh, now it's time for uh, for questions. We still have five, ten minutes for questions, and then some time before the other talk. Um, so, is there any sensitivity in in your implementation to the cache line size of the CPU, or is it independent of that? Do you have to find it out dynamically? I mean, it, it, so. As long as the cache line size is smaller than a page, you're good. And that's usually the case. So yeah, that's the only constraint there. <laughs> More questions? I see that uh, the coffee appears to be quite appealing this morning. <laughs> Feel free to uh, reach out to me. I'll be around uh, the whole weekend. Uh, there's another session on integrating librsec into uh, GNU libc, which has been moved to tomorrow. So uh, feel free to, uh, to join us uh, then, so we can pursue the discussion more specifically on that topic. Thank you very much.